Creators. I'm Nick Chelson, and welcome to my podcast. Today, I am talking with the one and only Claudia Chelson. Claudia is passionate about helping people live out their higher calling. She has worked as a youth ministry leader at multiple churches for a number of years, and she received her bachelor's degree in psychology as well as a minor in Bible and theology in 2020. But most importantly, she is my beautiful wife and teammate. In this episode, Claudia and I talk about the Discovery Plus series, Hillsong, A Mega Church Exposed. In this episode, Claudia also shares parts of her story about growing up and serving in a mega church. And we also look at what church leaders can learn from this documentary. So with that out of the way, let's get into my conversation with Claudia Chelson. Hey, Claudia. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. So you and I recently watched the Hillsong documentary or docu-series on Discovery Plus called Hillsong, A Mega Church Exposed. And we noticed some parallels to our ministry experiences. And you noticed some, especially with having worked at a mega church for a couple of years. So we thought it would be cool to record a podcast episode where we not only talk about the series, but also talk about some of your ministry experiences and some of the similarities between your experience and what some of the people in the documentary shared about their experience at Hillsong. And then just to kind of wrap it up, talk about what we think church leaders today can take away from this series. I would agree with that. I think that the docu-series was a lot. And um, I definitely related with some of the people that were sharing their testimonies, stories, Mm -hmm. experiences. Um, It felt very, um, almost like looking in a mirror. And I'm like, wow. Close to home. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize how similar it would feel watching them talk about things. So let's jump into it then. The summary of the series. So like we said, uh, Hillsong, A Mega Church Exposed is a docu-series on Discovery+. Plus. I think they did a really good job assembling just kind of a wide array of different perspectives and viewpoints, some people who are involved in the church. So they talked to former campus pastors, leaders, members, volunteers, and even college students from Hillsong. Um, They also interviewed Ben Kirby, uh, who's the creator of the Preachers and Sneakers Instagram account. He is so funny. Yeah. I, yeah, he's funny. I kind of stalk his account sometimes just to see the different things that he posts about pastors in their fashion choices, I guess. Yeah. And then they, of course, interviewed um, Renine Kameen, who was uh, Carl Lentz's mistress. The mistress is Mm -hmm. in the building. Like, Mm -hmm. oh my goodness. Creatively, they did such a good job. Like, I know it sounds bad, but when they showed the episode of her, you'll have to watch it, but they used the church and... Um, she was being interviewed in a church, right? Yeah, she was being interviewed in the church. And the way that they had her enter was because um, when you get married, I we've recently gotten married mm-hmm. in the last few years, You, the bride walks down the aisle towards like inward to the church. What they did with um, her is they had her walk out of the church, like mm-hmm. up back to you know, the opposite way. So from a creative standpoint, you know, someone that's participated in theater and drama and all, and, you know, Mm. set design and all that stuff. I thought it was done really well. (laughs) Yeah. Just the sin in the church kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's something we talked about. Just the creative direction of the documentary. Yeah. It was very, yeah, it was really good. It it makes, makes your skin crawl and, Mm -hmm. you know, on sections that it should make your skin crawl and, you know, Mm -hmm. So let's get into the series then. So it's broken up into three parts or three episodes, each about an hour long. So in the first part, it kind of talks about the origins of Hillsong Church, as well as their rise to popularity and kind of the impact they've had on Christianity and church culture as a whole. So for those who are unfamiliar, 1977, Frank Houston started a church in New Zealand. They actually merged with another church that Brian was leading in um, 1999 is when they merged, and it was called Hills Church. And Hills Church gained popularity through their music, which was actually called Hill Song, through a lot of Darling Sheck's songs, such as Shout to the Lord, 
they were able to gain popularity and begin licensing their worship music to different churches. So to kind of play off of that popularity, they changed the name of the church to Hillsong and then began expanding, uh, planning churches all around the globe, kind of in the 90s and early 2000s. And around this time, that's when they began to kind of pop up with some of their networks of colleges and annual conferences. And this is kind of where Carl Lentz comes into the picture. So Carl Lentz was initially a student at Hillsong College who was able to connect with Brian and then later was the pastor at Hillsong's New York Church. And Hillsong's New York was known for attracting celebrities such as Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez. Who else did they talk about? I think it was Kylie Jenner, Mm -hmm. Kendall Jenner, some of the Kardashian crew, I guess, Mm -hmm. would pop in there. Yeah. So, and this kind of concludes the first part, kind of like the origins and then the rise of Hillsong. Well, it's funny too, because I went to Hillsong, New York, Mm -hmm. like to a conference. It was a weird building. We had to take like an escalator up. That's all I remember. I don't know which building they're in now, but it was the building at the time Mm -hmm. where we got to like take a leadership, whatever under Christine Kane. So that was fun. Um, But yeah, so just, It's just, it's surreal having gone there. There -hmm. were people from the front all the way to the back and they did not care what seat they were sitting in. Mm -hmm. You know, they just wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. And I think that was the big takeaway for me. Like people were all the way up in the very back. You couldn't even see them because they were so far back. Mm -hmm. They didn't care. They were still there. They still wanted to experience God and experience a different level um, and take their relationship to the next level. So that's part one. Part two is where things start to go downhill as it primarily focuses on Carl Lance's affair as well as the church and public finding out about it. What I did like about the mistress, which I, I feel bad calling her a mistress, but I think that's how they identified her. They identified her, her as right. Carl Lentz's mistress. But, you know, like she doesn't have the mm-hmm. same moral compass. Let me just say it like that, right? Like Christians do. She doesn't have the same values or convictions. But she was still willing to come on and share her story because she Mm -hmm. felt like what Carl Lentz wasn't doing was he wasn't giving his people answers. Mm -hmm. He still has not said anything Mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. And she's the one who's coming in and saying, I could tell my story Mm -hmm. and give them something. Right. And like, but it's just interesting to me because she doesn't have the same kind of you know, responsibility that people in leadership or Christian leadership or being a believer or whatever do have. And she was still willing to sit there and explaining what happened and how she got to know him. And, you know, Mm -hmm. and it, you know, he approached her. Let's just remember that, Absolutely. you know, and she saw flaws with a lot of what he was telling her. And, You know, but she she has different beliefs. Well, she was asking him a lot of intentional questions. She said, are you unhappy in your marriage? Are you separated? Like, what's the deal? She had enough of a like, a, you know, as much as she could in her own belief, ask those questions. Like, Yeah. But then she's wrestling with that, too. The idea of, hey, you know, she had attended a Hillsong service where she saw Carl speak years ago in her life. And. Now she, she thought maybe encountering him now. So from her worldview, she's trying to figure out, hey, is this, is this fate? a sign? Is, is this a fate? Sign? Is this yeah, a totally. And but we can't hold her to standards. Carl didn't steward her well in that either. He kind no. of took advantage of that situation. Totally. Like, mm-hmm. and she already saw him as an authoritative figure too. Once we get to the third part, it's very mm-hmm. telling of how Hillsong came to this of where they're at now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that kind of leads us to the third part. And to be honest, this was the most difficult for us to watch. Trigger frankly. warning for yeah. sure. Definitely a trigger warning. So to kind of summarize, um, this part really goes into detail. Frank Houston's admitted abuse of children between the years 1965 and 1977. Um, it really goes into detail how the church tried to cover up Frank's admitted abuse yeah he definitely admitted to it and Mm -hmm. it's very it's very hard to watch the unspeakable done to children is never acceptable and this church made it seem as if that they could just wash it away and clearly they were able to for a long time Mm -hmm. but now it's all coming to the surface 
Yeah, and one thing that this part of the documentary does note is that Frank and Brian merged their churches into Hill's church after this abuse had already been known. Yes, and then like they tried yeah. to cover it up. He tried to pay out one of his victims mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because he knew he had done really awful things to this little boy. Yeah, and in this part of the documentary, it goes very into detail. One of the victims, um, Brett Sangstock is, I believe, how you pronounce his name. Um, They have his witness testimony describing in great detail what Frank did to him. Exactly. So um, if you're going to watch that, just be warned. Series kind of wraps up kind of noting that as a result of all of these things that Brian Houston has actually been criminally charged with concealing his father's abuse and um, his legal proceedings are still ongoing um, at the time of the documentary's release as well as the time that we're recording this. Another thing to note would be is that Brian Houston actually resigned before the documentary dropped Mm -hmm. And not just stepping down, not a sabbatical, like he has resigned from Hillsong Church mm-hmm. on the board as a senior pastor and just all of his responsibilities. He's um, relinquished those in light of this yeah. and probably because of his legal proceedings and as well as that they were going to see in great detail some of mm-hmm. the things that he concealed about his dad. This definitely won't be, this wasn't the first deep dive into Hillsong and it's certainly not going to be will not be the The last last. at all. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously not really an easy way to transition from that topic to our next one. But um, I think a lot of people are going to watch this documentary and they're going to use this as an excuse for why they don't go to church or perhaps for people who do go to church um, but go to smaller churches are going to use this as an argument for why you shouldn't go to a mega church. But I think that some of the issues that we saw in this documentary, particularly with celebrity culture, volunteer burnout, I think that those are things that we could see in any size church. One of the things we wanted to do is kind of hear your mega church experience. And you actually have some unique perspective of working at a mega church for a while. So I was volunteering, kinda, attending, volunteering. Yeah, I was working though. I just wasn't paid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're definitely going to talk about that volunteer culture and volunteer burnout. But um, just kind of wanted to get your perspective on that because you actually helped. You're on the event planning team mm-hmm. for a big conference that actually had Cara Lentz. Oh it. yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. Yeah, so actually, eight years ago this week which is funny that the hillsong documentary came out this week eight years ago this week was i was a part of an event planning team for a conference that still lives on today but it's no Mm. longer being ran by this particular church that i was at but it was when carl lentz wasn't huge yet i think he had just started um hillsong new york and he was a guest speaker at the conference and i happened to be ushering on the the door the side that he was Mm going to come in and so i had opened the door he had come down the aisle and he was with his entourage for the weekend i guess kind of like hosting him is kind of how this church did that they like just were like gave him a buddy basically to kind of be with him oh like a handler right yeah like make sure you know where he was showed Mm -hmm. him where the green room is walked him into the service. So it was like worship had just started and he was going to speak. So he came in maybe one song into worship because I imagine he probably wants his own time to Mm. kind of get into the zone. Yeah. Yeah. And so he came in um, and then I saw a lot of staff just like a magnet clout, like, you know, like, <laughs> really? Yes. Like go like all the, like we're all up on him where the poor man couldn't even like worship before he spoke. Like there was like seven people, like, cause mm-hmm. the person that was with him mm-hmm. walked him up to the front. He's like in the front row to the left. And then like a bunch of pastors like come in, like from the side, there was like this like side escape, like yeah. door or whatever. And like 
seven of them just like came in and they just like went right down to him and started right. talking to him and this looked like there's this crowd on the in the front left part of the stage if you're standing where i was standing at the door yeah and i was like what in the world like the poor man can't even like have a minute like alone before he goes on stage mm-hmm. like they didn't do a good job of this buddy system thing because everybody <laughs> and their mom was allowed to go talk to them literally so that's interesting so he really was treated like a celebrity this is like at the height of actually like when he started hanging out with justin bieber okay because i remember Mm -hmm. he had posted that sermon from that particular conference and justin bieber had shared it okay and everybody flooded it because justin bieber had shared him talking about this talking about this specific thing and so yeah it's just definitely like he was treated like a celebrity, which mm-hmm. I don't think is his, his own fault at, at that point. I don't think it was his own fault. I think mm-hmm. people wanted a little bit of a taste of, you know, who is this yeah. guy who's up and coming? Mm-hmm. Like, let me get my piece of the pie. But I'm like, well, he's he's trying to, like, vibe before yeah. <laughs> going on stage. He doesn't want <laughs> he doesn't want you and your wife and your and your kids and your, mm-hmm. you know, your your aunt and all that to talk to right, him like right. in the middle right before he goes on stage. So I just thought it was interesting. And I mean I was like eight almost eight. I think I was even seventeen or eighteen at the time and I was just yeah. like watching this. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And I just didn't, you know, I was ushering on the left side. So whether you were Carl Lentz or you were one of the youth kids or you were, you know, someone my age or you're from a different youth group, I'm not going to mm-hmm. treat you any differently. You know what I mean? I'm just going to say yeah. welcome to such and such conference. Um, Glad you're happy here. to find mm-hmm. your seats. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so that was a story. That was an interesting story. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. The idea of this celebrity pastor, which is something that they touch on in the series. So let's just kind of unpack that a little bit because I witnessed a similar experience when I was helping run our school's chapel program. Mm-hmm. They regu- You remember they regularly would have Francis Chan come and speak. And Francis Chan is one of those guys who is not chasing celebrity in the slightest. Mm-mm. Yet he still had all of these people drawn to him kind of in the same way. He would show up, he'd have his crew, and um, you just have all these people flocking to see him. People from out of the area would come to our school's little chapel service so just to hear them speak. So that's kind of what I want to talk about this idea of we do live in a celebrity culture. So I don't know if the idea of a pastor becoming a celebrity, so to speak, is something that we can completely avoid. It almost seems like it's inevitable. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that like, with Carl Lentz in in that mm-hmm. like regard, I think it's because he was around other celebrities that kind of mm-hmm. made him a celebrity on his own, you know? And so mm-hmm. it's kind of sad because we don't really, after, especially after this documentary, it's going to be hard for people to trust another pastor who happens to pastor celebrities. Like right. we've never gotten to the yeah. point where we're allowed to have those two things interchangeably. Like it's either your pastor or... Or you're a celebrity's pastor, but you can't be both. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I hope that we could come to that. And I hope that the fall teaches us that, if anything, how it's a slippery slope. It's a very narrow walk, you know, and clearly he succumbed to the pressure of that. Yeah. So one of the other things that they talked about in the documentary was they talked to a lot of different volunteers. Um, They talked to one of the lighting directors at the Hillsong new york campus Mm -hmm. um and then they talked to people who helped kind of what you were doing ushering greeting and a lot of them spoke very negatively of it to the point where they some described it as slave labor um (laughs) they talked about being used almost like she was just a cog you know or a wheel in the mega church machine um as someone who has volunteered in that kind of context do you have a similar experience oh yeah i mean i was the kid like i had just rededicated my life to jesus like probably like at the start of my high school career Mm -hmm. so i was like Mm -hmm. on fire like i wanted to volunteer for everything under Mm -hmm. the sun and they took it and they milked it and they took advantage of it and you know i 
I, I understand the burnout and like, I volunteered for everything. I really did. And I, I, it's not because I was forced to, but because I really wanted to, and they make Mm -hmm. you feel like special enough to where they can get you to do that, but Mm -hmm. they never stop you from overextending yourself. And I Mm -hmm. guess, you know, but I was in high school. So I think I have more of a, like, I guess a pass. Cause like, this is at this age, I'm still learning who I am. I'm going through all these changes. Mm-hmm. We're trying to find Jesus. And then like, there's this world that's coming at us. And then we, we don't know what boundaries are when we're young. And right. so I don't feel yeah. like it should have been my responsibility to say, Hey, you know, why don't we like implement some discipleship in that too? Or why don't right. you take a break? Or they never did that. Not once did they say, no, you can't volunteer for this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was always like, okay, awesome. Great. You know? <laughs> so. Did that lead ever lead to you feeling burnt out or used or. Resentful? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I totally did. And I think, I think it was because I was there and I was like faithful in that. And I wanted to serve at everything because I was new to the faith mm-hmm. and just with, you know, youth pastors in general, like I, I, as someone who was hanging, like these teenagers, we hang on every single word mm-hmm. that these pastors are saying to us. And we so badly, I don't think it was approval. I don't think I wanted approval. I don't think I wanted, you know, them to validate me or anything because mm-hmm. I wanted to serve the church. I wanted to make disciples. I wanted to be discipled, but I don't feel like it was like ever like it wasn't, it was like an unreachable like thing to get them to disciple me. Like Mm -hmm. it was like, I wanted to be discipled. And that was like clear cut. Like that's all I wanted. Like I wanted nothing else. And they just doesn't seem like much to ask for. Right. It's not a lot to ask for. And I was excited to be there. I wanted to, you know, I wanted that so badly from them and they just never gave it to me. Well, I do think that is interesting that you bring that up because they did talk about that, particularly with Carl about how it seemed like he was attracted to being a pastor from the preaching side, but then would neglect some of those other essential responsibilities. I remember we were one time we were driving in the car and I was in my youth pastor's car Mm -hmm. um, at the time. And he said, you know, I should really, people are reaching out to me. Like I, and because of who they are, I should let that get to my head. Oh, really? Yeah. He said that. And he was like, I should let that get to me a little bit. And I was just like, I will, I still like remember to this day. So obviously it was a defining moment for me, whoever it was. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't say who was mentioning out to reaching out to him, but I could put together cause we were getting ready to put on this conference and, you know, all these young youth kids, like, you know, we have hours in us, like we could burn, we could burn ourselves to the ground and still have yeah. some energy left over. So I remember I was painting sets up until the day of we were having this conference because obviously I had to work to be able to go to my own youth conference, which is we were the youth group that they were putting it on for in the first place. Mm -hmm. But it was either I worked the hours like volunteering before Mm -hmm. or during um, or they were going to charge us, you know, just like any other attendee to go. But given who they had, I imagine they really over it was very costly (laughs) with who they had coming to the conference. Was that the conference you told me went over budget? Yeah, <laughs> totally went over budget. I know that. Yeah, because the next year. Well, you're it, on the planning team. Right. So, yeah, well, well I, I had heard about it because yeah. obviously these, but they're like saying that they were maxed out mm-hmm. at their budget, over budget, and that they weren't allowed to spend any more money. So, well, let's just go straight into takeaways. What are some things that you think that church leaders can learn from this docuseries? I would probably say don't clout chase. Mm -hmm. Like you're being exactly what you're saying. You're telling your youth not to be Mm -hmm. like, don't go after the things of the world. Don't go da 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 da. Don't do all that. But you're doing that. Like you're chasing that thing, which could be that person. Like, Mm -hmm. which is why I love preachers and sneakers because he's so, um, he's so neutral. Like he's like, let's just have a conversation about the fact that this guy's wearing Gucci sneakers or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, well, if you're wearing Gucci sneakers and, your heart is pure, like, and it, it, it'll show on the outside as much as you're showing your shoes. So the takeaway there for church leaders is don't chase clout, not for yourself, not for others. Well, I mean, it's funny now because one, 
like look at what the where the clout chase ended like mm-hmm. carl lentz has fallen from mm-hmm. the church you know what i mean whereas yeah. a decade ago all of you were chasing after him like mm-hmm. he was gonna you know you know what i mean it's right. just funny to me now like how humbling is that yeah well yeah we're now nobody yeah <laughs> now everybody's like i don't know who him. that is <laughs> yeah carl who <laughs> yeah where before you know when he was somebody you know when he was justin bieber's pastor i remember seeing pictures of people saying oh throwback to such and such conference and now all those pictures have just disappeared from their social media which i think is interesting yeah it is one of the things that i wrote down as a principle that i think is really important is the idea of making sure that we're protecting the right people yeah in the beginning of the podcast we talked about some of the people who were really hurt and abused by the leadership. And I think that it's important as Christian leaders for us to remember that it's our responsibility, you know, going to this idea of a pastor as a shepherd, as a shepherd, our responsibility is to protect our members vulnerabilities, and not our leaders reputations. Yeah, I guess that's the next principle, I guess, that Mm -hmm. I had written down was to like invest in everybody like, and Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, you know, my experiences in youth group, Like, I don't think youth pastors understand the mandate and the privilege they have to disciple young people in the Mm -hmm. most critical years of their life Mm -hmm. when they're getting formed and they're ready, getting ready to go off to college and where the whole world is going to be open to them. Like it's sitting on your shoulders, what you ingrain into them Mm -hmm. because they're, like I said, they're hanging on every word that you said. It's not your responsibility for how they turn out. Mm -hmm. but you have a lot of influence during that time in their life more so than their parents, Mm -hmm. you know, like I know my my youth pastors had way more influence over me than my parents did. Yeah. And I, I noticed that they, they like, they didn't disciple all the youth kids. They just discipled like the ones that stroked their ego, which were the ones oh, that, interesting. um, it was like this weird, like pick and choose. So playing favorites with their students and their favorites were the one who's got the most discipleship essentially. Right? Yes. But like, they didn't understand, I don't felt, and they didn't want it. You know what I mean? Which was just so yeah. weird. Like they didn't want that. Like uh-huh. I so badly wanted that, mm-hmm. you know, and I even served, I think maybe a year after up until a year after I had graduated from high school. As like a young, as like a youth, like leader person. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was fun. Like I had my own friends and stuff like that. But like, I just knew that my time there was coming to an end. Gotcha. Like I remember we had gotten back from camp. So we did a summer camp all the time. And I'm sure that's telling what I'm talking about. But Mm -hmm. um, we had gotten back. And I think I I remember because it was so stupid to me. (laughs) It was 14 days after we got back from camp. So two Mm -hmm. weeks after we got back from camp. Um, one of the youth pastors, they texted me, they said, Hey, um, are you around today? Cause yeah. And I was like, sure. Yeah, I'm around. I'm like, am I in trouble? Like jokingly. And he had texted me back. He said, well, I'm not your parent. So no, you're not in trouble, but we would like to talk to you. And I'm okay. like, okay. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> so I was like, so I'm like hopping on over. Cause I'm excited. Like every, anytime I got to hang out with him, I was like, this is great. Like I can learn something like, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> you know, so I'm like hopping on over. And I get into a room and they bring me to this like room to talk. And um, there's like, it wasn't this person's wife, but it was another person's wife. Okay. So it was like a youth pastor and then somebody else's wife who was also a youth pastor. Okay. Um, And like, she sits me down and she's like, so I heard that you said something about me. I was 18 oh. at the point <laughs> at, at camp at summer. I heard you said something about me at summer camp. I'm like, okay, what did I say? Like, I don't recall saying anything about you at summer camp. Yeah. And this is kind of like, I'm coming to the end here. Like I'm at my last sure. straw. Yeah. Like I'm like, I'm 18 years old. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And, and I'm like, okay, can you explain to me more about what this is about? And she yeah. said, well, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, which happened to also be her favorites. So she had, and I was, they're like, oh, they said that you said this. And I was like, Okay, but I didn't. Mm. I didn't even share a cabin with these people. Like, yeah. and I didn't have anything against them. Like, I talked to them. We were all in the same kind of like small group and stuff. And she was Pretty like, standard. Well, I don't understand why they would lie. And I said, Well, I don't know why they would say I said that because I didn't even talk to them that much at camp. Like, right. we were in the same small group. We're having a good time, but I didn't have enough time to sit down and have like these deep seated conversations right. about why I, I hate their favorite person. And so I'm just sitting there like, Okay, but I didn't say that. And she said, well, can you just admit that you said it? 
And I was like, no, I'm not going to admit to something I didn't do. And I'm right, not going to admit exactly. to something I didn't say. Mm -hmm. And you should know me by now. You would know that I would never lie. And I would never speak ill of any of you. At that point, like they were like my heroes. You know what I mean? I would never say anything bad about them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm sure I had my moments. I was a high schooler. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Where I was just like, oh, so-and-so bothered me. Da -da -da. But if I had something to say at that point, I was 18 years old. I was learning what my voice was like. I would have just told them, hey, this bothered me, mm -hmm. you know? And so I knew I wasn't going to win that battle in that office. And she said, well, I, I don't know. I don't remember if they like removed me from leadership that day. I don't remember. There was some disciplinary consequence where mm -hmm. I was just like, you know what? It doesn't matter because I'm leaving anyway. So that kind of idea of this like controlling behavior, that's uh, was something that they talked about on the docuseries a lot was trying to control these narratives or these stories and um, the pastor trying to control people or situations or narratives. What do you think that was all about from your experience? What was the reason behind I don't that know. excessive I... control? Like I said, I think that they forever kind of frame you a little bit mm. into that same 14 year old, same 15. I mean, I'm 18 at this point. Mm -hmm. So I think that they don't one pastors need to let their kids grow like mm -hmm. and mature and branch out and try things like try like putting on this Bible study that they want to do. Like I remember I tried to do that. It got shut down immediately. Like I mm -hmm. wasn't allowed to do that. And, or if I continued doing it, I wouldn't be allowed to be in student leadership. I remember wow. there, there, and then I, it, it, the control though, like even after you leave, which I don't think, I think the, I think the docu series talked about it a little bit the, the after effects of leaving mm -hmm. a mega church that was toxic. Because I'm not saying all mega churches are toxic. So I think that with the people that shared those stories about the after results, I totally related to that because I remember. I remember leaving because I had prayed about it. I said, hey, I'm not going to go to college here anymore. I'm actually going to transition now. I want to go to a different college. Mm -hmm. um, so there's really no reason for me to serve here anymore because I'm already thinking about transitioning churches. There's mm -hmm. a new church in the area that I'm interested in that some of my friends are starting to go to. I thought maybe, you know, it, it was my sign that, that I was not going to grow anymore here. Like I had mm -hmm. reached my capacity here. But I remember like that control like that one guy that was crying, he was mm -hmm. saying like how it really gets inside of you, it really ingrains in you, the mm -hmm. things that they teach you. And he was saying, and I felt that because I remember when I left, it was like dead silence. Mm -hmm. Not a text, not a phone call, nothing after I left. Wow. It was like, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Yeah, it's like you're dead to them. Yeah, like the, nobody reached out, nobody said anything, mm -hmm. and said, hey, where'd you go? Like not a single word. And wow. You know, and then I had gone to a new church and this is where I'm wrapping this. I had gone to a new church and they were talking about having brave conversations. Mm -hmm. Like that was like the topic. And I knew I was working through a lot of church hurt, rebuilding mm -hmm. trust and all that kind of stuff. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to have a brave conversation. So I reach out to one of the pastor's wives, mm -hmm. one of my youth pastor's wives. And I say, hey, I'm working through all this stuff. Is there a way we could talk? I just want to wrap up some things and get mm -hmm. some clarity yeah. on some things that I closure, closure, I guess, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And by the grace of God, for some reason, she decided to call me. And so I answer. It wasn't like a, I'm so sorry, but it was like a, maybe we could have done something more for you. Like, and mm -hmm. like as a send off or something, I had mentioned something. I don't remember what I mentioned to her. Maybe I was talking about what I was doing now. And um, I said, oh, yeah, I'm like starting this blog and I'm going to have a lot of fun doing it. I don't remember how that came up. And she almost told me, like, it almost sounded like she told me that I couldn't do that. You couldn't start a blog? Like that I couldn't <laughs> have the blog. And it was yeah. like she didn't want me to. And I huh. was like, she's like, you know, you kind of need like accountability for that and da, 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 da. And I'm like, I have seven wonderful women that are giving me that. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. almost like on the phone she told me like that control was like still there where she was telling me that I couldn't do it. And mm -hmm. I felt myself sinking to that 16 year old self. And you know what's funny? Like one more story. Sitting with the same wife in the ca in this um, cafeteria, we were just kind of, I think we had gotten coffee or we we're going over something. Mm -hmm. And she, I remember I had told her, I said, you know, I think this is something I want to do. Like I want to marry a pastor and have cute kids and do mm -hmm. this thing with young people and blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And she, mm -hmm. she looked at me and she said, well, it doesn't always work like that. So I wouldn't get your hopes up. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, 
I don't know if I was like sharing my hopes and dreams with my youth pastor. It's fine. You just crushed my heart. It's fine. I mean, I was 16. Who cares? You just say like, oh yeah, totally. Like you don't have to like, you know, and I think it's funny now because I had written off in that very moment ever marrying someone in ministry Mm -hmm. ever. I was like, that is never going to be me, you know, because I'm like, I had so much pent up frustration. I didn't realize at the time, Mm -hmm. but I had written it off. I like mentally just didn't know until I was older. And now yeah. we're in ministry together and we're serving and da, 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 da. And I'm in the same position that they were when they started. Mm-hmm. Jokes on them. Yeah. That's, that is a lesson to other like young people that are listening to this. Mm-hmm. Your youth pastors, your youth leaders, your camp counselors at church, they, their, their potential that they see, the potential they see in you will never ever ever amount to the potential that god sees don't limit yourself to what they say whether it's Mm -hmm. good or bad because Mm -hmm. they could say something great about you and you surpass that you never Mm -hmm. know what's going to happen one of the things that i want to note and i kind of mentioned it earlier is that people can look at these different experiences people have had at hillsong or they can look at your experience that you had at a mega church and they can kind of come to the conclusion that all mega churches are bad. And for those listening, that is a hundred percent not the takeaway that I want you to have. I think some of these different toxic leadership behaviors we see, whether it's chasing celebrity or volunteer burnout, I think that you can see those at any size church. But all that to say, I think that this is a good time for the capital C church as a whole to kind of do an evaluation on mega churches as a whole. Kind of look at if these are some reoccurring themes or characteristics that we see in organizations like this. And if not, then make a point to highlight the mega churches that are doing a really good job. I mean, I would love to hear a story about a mega church that's just doing a great job of raising up humble servant pastoral leaders. I would love to hear stories of mega churches that have a great volunteer culture. And of course, I'd love to hear about mega church experiences where the congregation feels protected and cared for. Because neither one of us want to just focus on the failures of churches, but we do want to call them out when we see them. Oh yeah, I totally agree. You know, people people love to watch people's falls, right? Mm -hmm. And so more so than they love to watch their victories. And so when we were watching it um, and, you know, you get to that third part, which like I said, super trigger warning about, you know, abuse and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It it just shows that where, you know, you're not um, being honest in the beginning. Like what Mm -hmm. I am not surprised that Hillsong had its fall like this, just based off of the foundational, Mm -hmm. um, stories in the beginning like just to think about the unthinkable acts that frank houston had committed against these children Mm -hmm. like what makes you think that that ministry was going to thrive it's almost Mm -hmm. like an apple core like the apple rots from the you know the inside out and so and at the core of that was just deception Mm -hmm. and you know not being honest and not holding a leader accountable and Mm -hmm. trying to cover that up. And this is just a good example of showing that this is what happens when you try to do all of those things. In the docuseries, it obviously talks a lot about the music and Carl Lentz. Totally. The worship music and Hillsong New York and the college and just all of these things that they built. But it's just really, what really kind of surprised me was before all of these things happened, was like you said, this admitted abuse from Frank Houston and the attempt by Brian and the church leadership to cover it up in 1999. That was even before all of these big things. There was just this deception and this abuse that kind of laid the foundation for Hillsong. And you know, there is that passage in Matthew 7 that talks about building your foundation on a rock or building your foundation on a sand. And I think what this series shows is that Hillsong was built on sand and now that it's weathering the storms of its consequences it's uh it's coming down it's coming down and it's unfortunate and it's sad Mm -hmm. but justice is being served which is what we want ultimately and that is something that i put down 
just that is the experience of, of those who shared in the docu series. You know, aren't it's not necessarily just unique to Hillsong as you shared some of the it's not. church hurt it's that not. you had. It's running rampant mm-hmm. and it needs to stop. <clears throat> so I think it's important for Christian leaders to remember that when someone steps in your church, it is a strong possibility okay. that that person has some hurt from a previous church experience. Absolutely. And we need to pastor those people. We need to shepherd those people. We need to protect those people. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is one of the takeaways that I have is, hey, there are people who have this hurt and they still have hope that they can find community in this place. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, Claudia, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Of course, I will. This will not be my last appearance on the podcast. So, Claudia, what is the best way for people to connect with you online? Well, I have just my hub right now because I'm kind of in a bunch of different creative projects, but just on Instagram at Claudia Chelson. Great. We'll be sure to include a link to that in the podcast description. Thanks again for coming on. Of course. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. However you're listening, be sure to follow or subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you would like more leadership resources, be sure to visit my website at nickchelson.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode.